Thank you everybody for coming. Welcome, I'm Rachel Lessam, a research scientist from the Leonard Shanfield Research Institute at CJE Senior Life in Chicago, and I'm so happy you all could join us today. First, some housekeeping items. Um, please stay muted until our Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have any tech issues, please put those in the chat box. And also stay tuned for three more webinars from the SAGE Resource Project in early 2021. And finally, stay tuned as well for an evaluation after the end of today's webinar, which will be sent in an email to the email address you used when you registered. So this is a project funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute as part of their initiative to accelerate tools and resources. And we'll get started with approaches to engaged research and an introduction to the SAGE model. During this seminar, webinar, you will understand about engaged research and how it relates to stakeholder engagement overall, hear about examples of engaged research with older adults, recognize the value and benefit of seeking input from older adults and become familiar with the SAGE model for creating research advisory boards. Um, we'll get more into the nuts and bolts of the SAGE model in the following seminars. And we won't specifically address research design today as we're really looking at the input researchers uh, can use in making their research decisions. I'll now pass the proverbial microphone to my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Berman, who will walk us through engaged research. Research, excuse me. Hello, Rachel, thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I am also a research scientist at the Leonard Shanfield Research Institute at CJA Senior Life. I've been there since 2006. Before coming here, I was an assistant research professor at the Bueller Center on Aging at Northwestern University. And I was on the faculty of the Masters in Gerontology program at Northeastern Illinois University. So I've been conducting applied social science and evaluation since the 1980s, primarily in community and service settings and have been using stakeholder engagement for some time. My area of expertise in terms of methods is qualitative mixed methods, since I have a PhD in anthropology. So I'm really excited to kick this webinar off with a big picture view, um, giving you an overview of approaches to stakeholder engagement. So for quite some time now, I think researchers are pretty familiar with the idea that it, recognizing the people who are being studied um, is important because they have expertise and their expertise can actually shed light on how research can be done. So on this slide, there are a few frameworks for stakeholder engagement in research. Now, despite having some different approaches, each of these frameworks uses language that implies that they share some common themes. So if you were to read up on some of these frameworks, you'd hear things like engaging communities or stakeholders as full and equal partners. Um, recognizing the unique strengths and perspectives of stakeholders, uh, the importance of collaborating with communities and stakeholders in collective inquiry, and the whole theme of doing research with rather than on people, which is part of this broader effort to democratize knowledge. Now, the various frameworks also use different kinds of language when they talk about stakeholders. For example, sometimes they refer to stakeholders as being involved or engaged as serving as consultants, advisors, or reviewers, partners, co-investigators, or collaborators. Now, the underlying intent of each of these frameworks is ultimately to produce relevant, useful results for the communities or the populations being studied. At minimum, by focusing on research questions and outcomes that matter to those being studied, but often also by promoting positive social change or action-based research results. Next slide, please. So overall, these frameworks tend to share some similar principles of engagement. This is an example of one. Uh, this is the engagement rubric of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Uh, reciprocal relationships in their model uh, are, it refers to bi-directional relationships and shared leadership, such as group decision-making or possibly working hand-in-hand -hand with a community co-investigator. 
The idea of promoting equal voice and finding creative ways to compensate for real or perceived power differences is important in that principle. The second principle of co-learning is about understanding patient stakeholder experiences, building a shared understanding of purpose and value of research, and figuring out really how to communicate about the research process and research studies so that both parties, both the non-researchers and researchers are on the same level, and ultimately having an exchange of useful information. The principle of partnership is about building the capacity to work together. So that involves defining clear and reasonable roles and includes fair compensation for stakeholders and establishing structures or processes for collaborating. Finally, the last principle, trust, transparency, and honesty, is about having a commitment to open and honest communication that ultimately fosters a culture of inclusiveness and enables that collaborative work. Next slide, please. So in this webinar, what do we mean by engaged research? Research topics, designs, methods, analyses, and or dissemination strategies that have been informed through collaboration with or input from those who have a direct stake in your research. In other words, stakeholder engagement in research is about working collaboratively again, seeking knowledge from those who have a direct stake to ensure that your focus and design are relevant feasible and that ultimately that your findings are translatable and lead to sustainable solutions to well recognized problems. Next slide, please. So the literature on stakeholder engagement frequently emphasizes the importance of engaging stakeholders across all phases of the research process, from idea generation to use of results or throughout all stages of a particular product project. Another way to think about this is to identify the windows of opportunity for engaging stakeholders. So we can stop and think, what are the moments or points in our research process where we can seek feedback from stakeholders or elicit some input uh, or collaborate even, even in a more intensive way? Now, I did notice on the registration form that many of you have already taken advantage of these types of opportunities in at least one project. Next slide, please. So where are we today in this world of engagement? What kinds of examples are we going to hear about? Well, we're going to hear about three projects. First, we'll hear about a PCORI funded intervention project on telemonitoring. That project uses a community based participatory research framework and includes multiple stakeholder groups, including Hispanic Latino patients with type two diabetes. And that project employed multiple engagement strategies. Later on in the session today, uh, we will be talking about an engagement capacity building project that resulted in the development of the stage model. That project utilized PCORI's engagement rubric and included older adults receiving long-term services and supports. Uh, it resulted in, a, in advisory boards that are standing advisory boards where multiple researchers seek input or possibly on multiple projects. That's in contrast to the first project. The third example will be from um, will be an exercise intervention that where the researchers sought input from the Sage Advisory Board. Next slide, please. So another way to lay out the field of stakeholder engagement is along a continuum of engagement levels. This diagram visualizes the levels at which we can do this. So if you look at the vertical axis, um, that's the extent of commitment or involvement. And near the top, there are more intensive roles for stakeholders, which typically involve fewer stakeholders, but maybe some with particular expertise or experience. At the bottom, the horizontal axis is the number of stakeholders. Um, so down at the bottom, the roles tend to be shorter term, but involve a, involve a larger number of stakeholders. Also near the bottom, I want to point out that the boundaries between engagement and data collection may sometimes appear a little bit blurry or less distinct. For instance, engagement could include member checks in qualitative studies or talk aloud cognitive interviewing or focus groups for the purpose of improving data collection tools, surveys to seek inputs on aspects of an intervention design or data collection tools, and town halls and listening sessions for that same purpose. For So for example, in each instance, the purpose of that particular method is to improve the research, not just to collect data. 
In this continuum, I want to highlight that there is not a better or worse level or a gold standard. In fact, Tom Concanon, the Director of Stakeholder and Community Engagement at Tufts Clinical and Translational Science Institute, proposes that engaging stakeholders should be fit to purpose. He argues that selective engagement in only some aspects of a particular research study may be more appropriate for some types of projects or some types of research. So the underlying premise of this argument is that some engagement is better than no engagement at all. So where are today's examples on this continuum? Next. The various engagement strategies used in the telemonitoring intervention study fall right in the middle of the continuum, but there's more than one type that have different numbers of people involved. Next. The SAGE model for creating research advisory board fits somewhere in the middle as well. So even though it's an advisory group, though, I wanted to point out that the members take on shorter term roles, often in multiple projects. Um, I also want to point out that the standing advisory board model could be used by researchers in a fit for purpose manner, as Tom Kinkanen talks about. Those who study older adults receiving long term services and supports could come to a standing advisory board for input on selected aspects of their projects. And then our last example, uh, Margaret will provide an example of how one researcher sought input on an exercise intervention project. So now I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, Rebecca, for that overview. Um, and now we'll get started with our first poll on how we all have engaged stakeholders. So uh, please take a moment. It uh, can choose more than one response. Well, with about 75% of everyone voting, I think we can close the poll and share our results. So um, it looks like most of us have, uh, have used some sort of stakeholder engagement with 47% um, having a research partner, a team member, which is really at that top level, um, near the top level of that continuum. Um, but, uh, and a couple people have used some other strategies that I hope we can hear about in Q&A, but uh, there's a wide variety I can see by our uh, participation in stakeholder engagement. So um, I'm gonna close the poll and I'm really excited to um, introduce our next speaker. She was unable to join us live, but um, was made, able to meet with us beforehand. Dr. Renee Peck-Mazaris is an expert in the field of telehealth with chronic conditions, as Dr. Berman mentioned, and she's been utilizing research engaged research methods for um, about 14 years. Good afternoon. My name is Renee Peck-Mazaris. I'm Vice President for Community, Community Health. Health and Health Services Research at Northwell Health. Um, I work for the Department of Medicine and the Center for Health Innovations and Outcomes Research. I have an um, appointment at, in, in uh, the Departments of Medicine and Population Health at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Um, one of the primary research interests of mine is exploring how we can use home telemonitoring technology to improve quality of life for patients who are living with chronic disease. So my objectives today are twofold. I want to be able to give you an example of how to effectively engage stakeholders through the CBPR process, and also to show you how and why engagement improves the research process. Um, there are three major components to our telehealth intervention that patients receive. The first part is we monitor vital signs um, using 
Bluetooth-enabled peripherals, such as a glucometer, blood pressure cuff, and weight scale on a daily basis. The second part of our intervention is a scheduled weekly visit with the clinician. The third part of the intervention is a series of videos that provide patient education about type 2 diabetes and is discussed between the patient and the nurse weekly in their preferred language. So this study had two aims. Aim one was to adapt our telemonitoring intervention to facilitate acceptability and feasibility in a new population of underserved Hispanic patients with type 2 diabetes, also their caregivers and providers. We're going to be primarily focusing on Aim one today, though. So in order to uh, adapt the intervention, created this community advisory board that are comprised of many different stakeholders to guide the study process. And I would say the, the, the majority are patients and caregivers, but we also have CBOs um, sitting at the table who represent patient needs, healthcare practitioners that serve the population, whether it's in um, health policy experts, but so that whatever policy is developed is relevant. Same thing with health finance experts, and then of course disparities experts. As far as AIM-1 and the adaptation process itself, so we start off with our original intervention, which again, I'll remind you, is, is, is daily, daily vital signs monitoring, weekly visits, and these educational videos. And then we conduct a number of focus groups with our community advisory board, and we present every screen and every word on every screen in both English and Spanish to the community advisory board and its subcommittee panels. Um, and one of the reasons we did this is um, it turned out that uh, we've learned over the years that sometimes patients are a little intimidated speaking in front of the commissioner of health about what they like and don't like about a screen, you know, what's on the screen. And besides having the overall group break down into patient advisory committee and a provider panel, because sometimes also the doctors have things they want to say. So it, it was very interesting to learn how to do that. And then in addition to doing focus groups, with these, uh, groups we also do theater testing where we have patients sit down with the tablets and use it and think aloud and tell us what they're thinking. Um, and it's really interesting to do that because you find out a lot of different things. So from this process, we got CAB adaptations from the Community Advisory Board. And next, what we did was we conducted a pilot study um, and focus groups and structured interviews of pilot study patients who are using the technology in their homes. And the reason we do that is because it's one thing to use something in a classroom, it's another thing to actually bring it into your home. And so we, we learn a lot of on the ground issues. So things like that we learn about in a pilot. Um, so we have to take all of this input and put these adapt adaptations together so that we have a final uh, adapted intervention for use in a randomized control trial. We learned a lot. <laughs> we learned, for example, that language translations are really important. And there are certain words that um, that the community would prefer use of. So most of the telehealth programming out there use the word glucosa for sugar. And you know the community basically said we're, they're much more familiar with than likely with um, azucar instead. Um, as far as culturally congruent videos, they hated the videos that we first presented to them that were part of the telemonitoring intervention. They were in Spanish, but they felt that they were dubbed over, you know, English videos, and they did not properly represent them um, in terms of representation of a person as well as the food that they eat. Um, and the other thing that we learned a lot about was tablet adaptations. There are a lot of changes that, um, that patients were able to make, and I'll talk about them in a minute. From the pilot adaptations, we learned that many of our patients are working extended hours, multiple jobs, and that they really cannot be seen, in the nine to, or many cannot be seen within the nine to five framework of a to, you know, typical clinic. So we had to extend nursing hours to nights and weekends. We learned that the enrollment process was both too detailed and took too much time. Patients didn't like uh, spending that much time. Um, the other thing was that the patient recruiter um, was unfamiliar to patients sitting in a clinic to have someone come up to them and talk to them about um, being enrolled in a study, especially in this environment politically. You know, people were afraid to talk to other people about who they are and what they do. So um, we ended up developing brochures and that were hung up in the clinic so that people saw that Jose was indeed our recruiter, was indeed the person that is on the wall at the clinic. So there are different types of, I um, thought it would be neat to show you the themes and quotations. In terms of changes to the intervention, um, patients felt um, it wasn't culturally appropriate. You can see the, uh, the words in the patients.
that's used here, but it, it, this is not transcultural. This is just a, you know, a translation. And that's not what we want in terms of our intervention. Um, the foods, it says Latino population. It didn't seem to be foods from the Caribbean or South America. It looked like an American diet. And on the other hand, they said wonderful things about nursing. They really loved our, our telehealth nurse. You know, they said, one person said, yes, most important thing for me was the language because my doctor speaks English and I was more comfortable speaking with the Spanish speaking telehealth nurse than with my doctor. The other way that we made changes was changes to the study process itself. And so, for example, um, patients did not like the very long time that it took to enroll them. And so we had a significant change the way in which we structured uh, enrollment itself. That was really wonderful. I did have a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind. At what point did you bring stakeholder engagement and CBPR into this, this work? Um, I would say probably seven or eight years ago. The mm -hmm. first few studies we did, we looked at um, patients who were in home care mm -hmm. and um, looked at hospitalization rates and the heart failure population. When you change your setting and now you're in outpatient, your major intervention is still telehealth and, you know, a weekly visit and, you know, uh, daily vital signs monitoring, but you only see your doctor every three, four months for an outpatient visit. So the comparator really changes. So as we were changing comparators, changing populations, we realized how important uh, adaptation was. And so that's when we started using the community-based research process. For your work, at what point have you involved uh, stakeholders and what part of the research process? Oh my God, in all of it. From the time we start thinking about writing proposals, um, we do a lot of uh, structured interviews and focus groups with patients to see what is important to them because we want to be able to define our outcome. You know, just because, uh, you know, too often in healthcare, we kind of come up with our ideas in this ivory tower. And, um, you know, we don't necessarily think about what's important. So what we've done um, now, when, whenever we're developing new applications, we go to the patients first and ask them what's important. And how would you say um, stakeholder engagement has affected your success in getting funding? I think hugely. I think, mm -hmm. hugely. I think you know, if you're able to demonstrate to a funder that you actually are involving patients in every part of the research process. That's from developing what your outcome is going to be to changing your intervention to disseminating the data. So, for example, you know, at the end of this study, um, the chair of our community advisory board is also someone who is a diabetes expert um, that is often on uh, Telemundo. And, you know, she's well known by the Hispanic community. And this is a way to share this information with the population at large and not just to other researchers mm -hmm. um, because it's important that the population knows and asks for this particular type of intervention if we show it to be efficacious at the end. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about um, addressing some of the power imbalance when they're all at the table together. Right. So at the community advisory board level, which is the large group of everyone, the, the payers, the providers, I mean, you have a patient who is, you know, potentially underserved, um, you know, maybe going to a clinic for free care and sitting next to the health commissioner who's in charge of that free care or, you know, someone from an insurance product and it, it can be a little intimidating. And so the idea there was to, um, to have everyone at the table together to be able to express themselves in front of each other, but then also to break up the group so that and, and we often do find that when we get into the patient advisory committee that different things are said than would be said at the larger advisory board committee. Um, I hope you all found that um, as illuminating as I did. And before we move on, um, we're going to launch our second poll um, about which of the stakeholders you've sought input from using those techniques we talked about earlier.
So um, if we could end the polling and share our results. Um, about 80% of us participated and you can see from the results even of this already engaged group, um, active older adults are sought out more often and engaged more often, um, although we still have a wealth of experience of people who are engaging older adults with chronic conditions and even those uh, with long ter term care and services, both in facilities at home, but you know, a much, much smaller percentage, um, almost half of those who engage active older adults. Um, so what exactly is the SAGE model then? As Dr. Berman mentioned at the beginning, it's a standing and ongoing research advisory board guided by the PCORI principles of engagement. And along that continuum that we looked at earlier, it's a larger group of between five and 10 people that is based on a partnership between an academic partner, such as a university or department, and an LTSS provider, and an ongoing reciprocal relationship between the two of them. The research advisory board itself is comprised of older adults who operate as sages and offer guidance from the expertise of their own lived experience. And in contrast to the community-based participatory research model in Dr. Peck Mazaris's example, they're not tied to a single project, but rather they truly function as sages, giving their input to multiple projects and multiple researchers. And in this way, the SAGE model results in engaged research and greater research, research success. Moreover, it's a flexible approach that allows us really to say that all research can and should be engaged research. The SAGE model began about four years ago and began because as evidenced in the poll, the voice of older adults in long-term care is largely absent from research and the acknowledgement that even researchers who are doing that have never had the experience of being in long-term care. So the goal during that first two years was to prepare a diverse group of stakeholders with the information and knowledge and training on patient-centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research in order for them to serve as an advisory bureau to the Leonard Shanfield Research Institute at CJE and also serve as, a, as an advisory bureau to local and national researchers wishing to conduct CER or PCOR research. research. And moreover, for the, for the sages to really serve as champions and role models for incorporating the voice of diverse patient populations into research. So the initial Bureau of Sages was uh, at the Lieberman Center for Health and Rehabilitation, which is part of CJE Senior Life, and consisted of nine older adult members, some of whom were nursing home residents and some of whom were stay-at-home elders. It also included six professional members who were involved in research and clinical practice. And the stakeholders really learned from one another through monthly retreats with researchers intermingling with SAGES and doing activities that enhance the co-learning process. And the benefit of having a skilled nursing facility with our own agency was we didn't have to seek out a partnership. And at the same time, we still recognized that that partnership relied on staff time at Lieberman and the staff's own investment. So we found that the Bureau of Sages at Lieberman was really a success, but the next step was to translate it and disseminate it. So we conducted stakeholder interviews uh, with researchers, older adults, and providers to identify the key elements that would allow us to disseminate and translate the SAGE model into new settings. We did this by partnering also with the Scripps Gerontology Center at Miami of Ohio and the Leading Age LTSS Center at UMass Boston. We oriented them to the SAGE model and then the academic partners then went out and developed partnerships with LTSS providers to create SAGE model research advisory boards. Additionally, we had developed a suite of materials during the Bureau of Sages project that we then modified and enhanced 
for our partners to be able to use. And these resources cover the different aspects of the process of building a SAGE model board, operating a SAGE model board, and evaluating it. And they, the academic and provider partners used and adapted these resources. So to start out, uh, both the provider partners and the academic partners along with the SAGEs would review the mission. This on the screen you can see here is the mission of the Bureau of SAGEs. And the new SAGE model boards would review the mission and either adopt it or make changes that were noteworthy for them with input from their own members. The same was true at, uh, for the values that the this, this SAGEs had adopted. And as you can see, these values really reflect the PCORI engagement principles and were again adopted by new SAGE model boards with their own, um, either as a whole or with their own uh, interpretations. So we've talked a lot about co-learning and dismantling the hierarchy. And one of the ways we do that is through this biosketch. And here we have an example of uh, a biosketch of our own uh, Dr. Rebecca Berman. And you'll notice that unlike professional biosketches we're used to seeing with degrees and awards and publications, there are simply two questions that everyone answers really about why we're here, why we're in a SAGE model research advisory board along with pastimes. And doing this kind of biosketch helps equalize the power dynamic between the researchers and the older adults and helps to remind us that we're all here for the same purpose and we all have expertise to contribute. And it's filled out by every SAGE member, every staff member who works with the board and every researcher who comes to seek input. So this is the basic structure of a SAGE model board. Every board has a facilitator who recruits and trains the SAGEs and facilitates meetings with researchers. And the SAGE model boards have had facilitators with a variety of experiences from a social worker to an activities director, a volunteer and a researcher. And new facilitators um, are trained and get orientation. And inc that includes observing meetings of existing research advisory boards. The facilitators then train the SAGEs themselves. And the length of that training is varied, but utilizes the SAGE resources um, suite of materials that we have created. And um, they are then able to use those as an orientation and training with minor adaptations or additions as they see fit in their own setting. And these training activities are used to build the SAGE members capacity and the confidence to talk with researchers. Um, most SAGE model boards meet in person as a group with their facilitator. And while most prefer to meet in person with researchers, um, current conditions mean that everyone has to meet virtually, but even before COVID hit, two of our boards um, always met virtually with researchers, one because they are with stay-at-home elders, and the other because it's in a rural area of Ohio, which is really inaccessible um, for researchers who are seeking input. And then the resources provided are also given to resource researchers. They're given templates and guidance for how to tailor their, their presentation to get relevant input from the older adults. Meeting frequency can vary from as often as every other week to only in as needed, on an as needed basis. Um, and following with PCORI principles, stakeholders, um, the older adults are compensated with a stipend, usually in the form of a gift card so it doesn't interfere with any federal benefits. Um, and provider partners also um, have been given stipends so that they can use them for food during meetings, to help support staff time, and to help with technology costs, which have been necessary in order to allow the virtual meetings to take place. So the goal of the SAGE model is really to embed engagement in the research process, as mentioned both by Dr. Berman and by Dr. Peck Mazaris. So this includes whether it's the next topic of study, 
whether you're designing your study, refining your proposal and demonstrating to a funder that you have stakeholder input and the research is relevant. Um, implementation, um, addressing issues that arise during implementation, analyzing your data and your results and being able to interpret them based on the lived experience of the sages. And finally, dissemination strategies. Ultimately, um, our goal as researchers is to have our research have real world implications um, beyond just peer review. And another trend among father, uh, excuse me, among funders and other government research institutes is there's a push for public summaries so that research can be consumed by diverse target groups, expanding knowledge and application. And while our next speaker will share more examples of feedback from the sages that had an impact on her work, this slide, you can see examples of the variety of research topics, as well as the type of feedback um, that sages have given. And we've had over 20 researchers. And in the process, we've also surveyed um, the researchers who've presented to the SAGE model boards. And all researchers surveyed felt that their experience either fully met or exceeded their expectations for seeking input. Um, and an example um, of some of the feedback we've received um, are on this slide. For example, quote, I received vital feedback about additional variables to collect to improve the context of my results. And the sages helped highlight and identify the challenges of conducting this work with older adults and nursing home residents. And finally, the personal experiences shared by the sages gave me some new ideas about how to talk about our resource with caregiving families. And now um, I would like to turn the mic over to Dr. Margaret Danilovich, who is going to share her experience of presenting to our original Bureau of Sages board. Great, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you the opportunity to share my experiences um, with presenting to the Bureau. Um, so our study is currently ongoing and is funded by the Retirement Research Foundation in which we are testing the impact of a high versus casual speed interval walking training program among assisted living residents. Some of the walking tasks are shown in the video on this slide. My purpose in seeking feedback from the Bureau of Sages was to inform the protocol finalization and to work with stakeholders who were willing to actually pilot the protocol with our research assistants before we launched the study. So we met with Bureau members in the first two to three months of the study ramp up. One of the challenges in launching the study with stakeholders, rather than perhaps incorporating the stakeholder feedback into the grant application, was that our stakeholder group did not fully align with who we were targeting for enrollment. Stakeholders were members of the Bureau of Sages at Northwestern and were community dwelling older adults, while we were enrolling residents of assisted living. It would have been more beneficial to more explicitly match these groups because some of the advice regarding recruitment strategies did not map onto our target group. Then one of the key issues we wrestled with was that we had written our application to test an intervention length that matched the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines for exercise duration. But our stakeholders thought that was too much. It was too much exercise. And so in the end, because it was important for us from a scientific perspective to match existing guidelines, and because we incorporated stakeholder feedback after the grant had been written, funded, and IRB approved, we decided to stick with our intervention duration and not change this based on the stakeholder input. But I definitely think that is something we could do differently in the future, particularly as we look ahead in the coming year to write a federal grant application using this approach. Despite these challenges, there were some wonderful benefits to incorporating stakeholders after we were funded. 
It allowed us to pilot the protocol prior to starting the study with our research assistants so that they could be better trained because they had practiced with older adults and had gotten feedback from the actual participants um, and on things like communication skills, volume of voice instructions. And that practice really allowed us to be much more efficient and effective with our study procedures once we began enrollment. So we were also able to pilot data collection with our outcome evaluator. And through that collaboration with our stakeholders, learned that prioritizing some of our cognitive testing earlier in the data collection sessions was much more acceptable for participants rather than doing cognitive testing after physical performance measure collection. Overall, presenting to the Bureau was a positive experience for us to set up our study for better success. And going forward, we'd involve stakeholders even earlier in the process in order to create a protocol that had greater patient level acceptability. Thank you so much, Margaret, for sharing your experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Um, next, the one uh, person or people we haven't heard from yet are the sages themselves. And I wanted to make it clear that in addition to the researcher's positive experience, the sages have positive experience as well. Um, our sage partners um, gained confidence and were comfortable learning basic research ideas. Members demonstrated that confidence when they were talking with researchers. They were able to verbalize their personal experiences relevant to the topics being discussed. And facilitators as well were able to reframe those personal experiences in ways that could be applied by the researchers. Um, moreover, the sages felt respected and heard by researchers. And while we all would prefer to be in person and face-to-face, -face, uh, members found that the virtual experience was far better than expected. And one person even said that she felt that it was like magic. Um, additionally, the Bureau of Sages and the Sage Model Research Advisory Boards are very different type of activity than is typically found in long-term care. And the SAGE members really appreciated the intellectual stimulation that comes with being part of that board. And moreover, they enjoyed the social experience of interacting with residents they may not have otherwise encountered and have really experienced um, a group identity and bond from being part of uh, the Bureau of SAGES and the SAGE Model Research Advisory Board. As one of them said, it's all worth your time. You learn a lot of things about people and yourself too. But of course, rather than hear me talk about that, um, I would like to introduce you all to Fern, who has been a member of our Bureau of Sages for a number of years and uh, shared her reflections on that experience with us. to learn and experience what it is like for an older person to be confined like this. Uh -huh. When you've been active physically and socially all your life, you are now in a position that is totally different. Uh -huh. You must do whatever you can do to make it work. I don't know if we've given advice as much as just um, for you to be listening to us as to what it's like because you've never lived in a home like this. So my advice would be to just listen to what we have to say, uh -huh. to give us questions for us to answer. and. Um, answer to the best of our ability. Okay, great. I mean, that's why you're getting grants is to learn. So if you prod us, it may not be the right word, um, to speak our minds, then it's good. It's easier to understand them if they tell them, tell us the purpose 
of this visit and the purpose of the grant, then we're, I know I am very happy to give information because this is my life now. Mm -hmm. That's where it's at. Mm -hmm. And it takes a period of adjustment for somebody to leave their home, their job, their social life, their mental activity, everything. Okay. And that's what this, these studies should be learning. Great. To me, when I came the first time, it was interesting. There's Professionals come in in all different areas of uh, geriatrics. And to hear what they have to say and give us input to me is important. Okay. Actually listening to the others in the group okay. is the most challenging and just keeping silent while I listen and not interjecting. And it's very interesting to hear what other people have to say. And like what David said, you have empathy because everybody's got their own problems. Great. And how to deal with them. Interacting and listening to the other people. Okay. And what the researchers have to say and the visiting guests. Uh-huh. How else would they know anything else like this except to speak to the residents? So uh, thank you to Fern for sharing that with us. And I'm so excited you were all able to join us. We're really looking forward to digging into this further and the nuts and bolts and nitty gritty details about how to make the SAGE model work for you. So in January, we'll talk about building research advisory boards. In February, we'll talk about supporting the operation of SAGE model research advisory boards. And we'll wrap it up in March by, by talking about evaluating the research advisory board process and outcomes. So please save those dates. I hope you can join us. That wraps up our formal presentation, but please stay if you have the time for Q&A. For more information on the SAGE resources, you can go to the link on this slide. And on the left-hand side of the website, you'll see a navigation pane and you'll see the SAGE resource project. Um, additionally, uh, keep an eye out for an evaluation on how we did in this webinar. And again, we're so excited you can join us. So please, if anyone has any questions, we would love to share them or answer them rather. I'm gonna stop the share. So you can either um, put them in the chat or raise your hand if uh, we can answer any questions. Uh, yeah, Roger, why don't you I, go ahead I, and start I, us off. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. That's great, Rachel. That's been a great series of presentations. I, I thought it was really, really good. Uh, the question I'm interested in is, uh, do the SAGE group, do they have a set of standard questions that they always ask uh, researchers that come to them that are interested in doing research? You know, like, um, say, for example, like, a, do they like have like a, a like a, a, a standard set of questions that they ask everybody or is it adjusted to according to the project. The reason I'm asking, is it's like uh, so many organizations and so many older people get asked to take part in research. And I was involved in developing a toolkit, which mm -hmm. was a set of questions, but in America, in your context, it will be a slightly different set of questions. But so that's my, that's my question. So what we have done in the past is we provide each researcher with a PowerPoint template. Um, of really breaking down their project simply with objectives and goals um, and a few very um, plain language highlights of their study. And then we ask them to come up with specific questions that they want feedback on. So if it's, 
you know, developing quality of life. How do you measure quality of life in a nursing home? That might be a question. Either here are the questions we've come up with. What are we missing? What do you think of them? And what else is there? So it's very tailored to each individual researcher. Okay, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, Margaret, I'm going to ask this one to you, actually. Um, what was your experience learning about engaged research um, during grad school? Um, because I think there's been a lot of talk about um, when do researchers really learn about engaged research and how do we learn to start using it in our practice? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, just for context, my PhD is in public health. Um, so we definitely had a CBPR course that was its own independent course to learn those principles. Um, I think with the rise of PCORI as a desirable funding mechanism that people are wanting to apply to, the concept of engagement is being stressed more um, in, in graduate school in certain areas. Um, and I'm going to say that caveat because my background is a physical therapist. And I think that in the rehab sciences, we don't uh, stress engaged research nearly as much as we need to. And so we see an exorbitant amount of uh, rehab research coming out that is testing interventions that have no uh, input from the patients who would be receiving these rehab inter interventions. So I think that there are opportunities there. It's highly uh, institution dependent. Um, if someone is training at an institution that is more basic science focused, um, more mechanistic, I think there's less opportunities to learn um, uh, this kind of philosophy and approach. Um, which is to people's detriment. And really it's to scientists detriment, but also the, the patient group for whom studies matter. Because in the rehab context, I think we see a lot of interventions um, or rehab products that come out that are being tested that have very little uptake because patients don't want this or um, it, it just doesn't work for them in, in their lives. And so um, I think it's, it's better than it, it was you know, 10 years ago, but we've got a, a huge way to go to really um, make this more of patients and people at the, at the heart and at the center of the work that we're doing. Thanks, I, I totally agree with, with that. We also, uh... I think had one course that was actually taught at a satellite uh, sister school when I was uh, in grad school with social policy, which is um, very hands-on and, and uh, related. Um, Martina, um, go ahead, you have a question. Oops, hold on, you're, you're muted. Martina, you're muted. Sorry, does it work now? Yeah, great. Sorry, um, I have a question to, um, thanks for the presentation, great uh, input. Um, I have a question with regard to building trust. I mean, the experience we have is that it takes some time before you really have a person on the board. Um, and then the other thing is also when we uh, discuss, uh, when we talk to people, then we may say, okay, you are fine for advisory board, or maybe you are going to be a co-researcher or you're going to, uh, you know, maybe involved at a later stage. And then one issue always is coming up is like, uh, is the time to invest and also boundaries and also to have a better understanding of uh, maybe a person might be very engaged, but maybe there's not a perfect fit. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit about that kind of period that may happen before I'm even on the board or as a co-researcher. Thanks. Um, so I can start with that. And then Rebecca, if you want to join in, because Rebecca is really involved in the, the startup. But I would say um, one of the issues of trust is really our trust now comes 
from having been a standing group for so long. So all the SAGE members really know each other well and trust each other well and have confidence in their abilities and also um, trust the facilitators. So um, it's often me or another colleague um, from our research institute and also a volunteer who's been working with the board for a number of years. Um, so that's where that trust comes rather than taking the time to build up a trust with an individual researcher. And I think that's, um, I mean, it can be both a pro and a con. I think in this SAGE model, it's definitely a pro in that anyone can come in and present their research and get feedback, um, but there's not necessarily that ongoing relationship with that particular researcher, even though there is sort of overall with our department. Um, Rebecca, do you have anything? Yeah, and that would be different yes. for us because then we would be involved directly with the people. Yeah. Right. Yes, I think I can speak to the trust issue having been um, on board from the very beginning. I would say that early on, it was very difficult to develop trust among the older adults who were first invited to the very first bureau. Um, primarily, it was their lack of confidence that they could contribute anything. So we had to work very hard at building their confidence. We did that by creating, um, working through, I guess, what you would call allies of the nursing home residents. So at that point in time, there was a pretty robust art therapy program. And we purposely included staff from the art therapy program in the development of the bureau so that those persons could serve as an ally between us researchers, uh, the research department who the sages had no idea who we were and their involvement. And that developed over time. It took quite a while for that first group to develop a sense of trust and a sense of confidence that what they could contribute would actually be listened to. And the second tier of that was the, the trust issue also related to, will this make a difference in my life? And it took them quite a while to figure out that no, it might not make a difference in their life, in their specific setting where they're being cared for. But they began to realize that their role was a more altruistic role to make it better for others in similar situations. That leap of faith took place somewhere in the second year in the first bureau. Now we have bureau members who can serve as peer mentors and it's much easier to explain this to other people. So that I hope that addresses your question. And, and I'll just add, I think this is an important point, particularly as we are looking at working with underserved communities or communities of color mm -hmm. that have been historically yeah. um, used by researchers who come in, take information, take data and leave. Yeah. And so I think as we approach working with those community groups, we need to be thinking not in terms of research, but actually building a relationship. And you might spend your first year yeah. just getting yeah. to know people and coming to events yeah. and yeah. Um, working with that community and just coming to their things and then mm -hmm. start talking research um, and just building that trust takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And we uh, should not at all just expect that it's going to happen. And I think researchers mm -hmm. really need to be taking the steps to put ourselves in those communities versus saying, come to our academic institution and we'll learn about each other. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of work to do, particularly as we move down kind of the, the scale of populations who are less heard in research and less included in historically disenfranchised communities. Great, thanks a lot. I will just add in that one of the goals of, dis of disseminating the SAGE model is that we hope that this model will also be brought into communities of color, not just, you know, nursing homes that have a lot of resources, maybe, you know, assisted living facilities or other kinds of community organizations that serve similar populations. And I think that goes a little bit too to the funding issue as well. We were lucky from PCORI to have money to give to those LTSS providers, but um, many we've found many facilities who have majority um, marginalized communities may have lower levels of staffing, um, higher staff turnover, and um, 
need uh, more support from us to enable that to happen um, because it does take staff time and commitment as well um, to help these SAGE model research advisory boards um, continue and be sustained. Um, so we're just about at time, um, unless there are any other questions that uh, any of us are happy to answer. Um, oh, okay. Um, so uh, Suzanne Beltran um, just asked about standardized training materials. If you go to the link at cje.net um, slash research, you'll see that there is um, a menu and it'll say the SAGE resource project. And within that you can find all of the SAGE resources that we have compiled for um, building the boards um, and what we've used as training materials for the SAGEs um, as well as, um, as researchers. Um, we do not have them available in different languages at this point though. But feel free to check those out. And um, I'm happy to um, answer any questions um, as well by email. I'll put my email address again. So um, thank you, everybody.